Okay, this is going to be lecture number 10. We're about to get through with all these lectures. Hopefully, I'll have these done and y'all can be watching these here pretty quickly. Uh, this lecture is titled, lecture number 10 is titled The Cold War. Also in this lecture, I'll be including a lot of information about the civil rights movement. Actually, this lecture is going to cover about 24 years after the, after the Second World War. So this lecture is going to end somewhere around 1968 time period. And uh, I've combined these two lectures together <coughs> with Civil Rights Act and the Cold War to make it more fluent and, and, uh, and it has a better flow to it than it would otherwise. I want to start off by introducing to you guys a gentleman whose name is Henry Luce. Henry Luce is the editor of the Time Life magazines. He's a gentleman who told the American people in 1941 that we're in, we're going into what is called the American century. The American century will be a hundred years in which America must clean up its social problems and must clean up world problems. We've got two missions here, guys. We got to make sure the United States is going to be an area of the world that is free to all people who live in the United States. And there's no exceptions to it, that everybody has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And you can see a lot of change take place between 1945 and 1968. Okay. The second part here, guys, we got a troublesome world. The world is in terrible shape after World War II. And of course, a lot of this was was started by World War I, and we got to spend lots of dollars and lots of time trying to rebuild the people who live outside of the United States, trying to give them a sense of hope, a sense of destiny. And so this lecture is very important to understand how we got into our present situation here in the world. World War II changed everything. And Henry Luce says for the next 100 years, America has got to reform itself and reform the world. Well, guys, we're 20 years away from his deadline. And I don't think we're going to make it. I don't, unless something really serious happens, I don't think we're going to solve the world's problems and get things in social order in the United States by the year 2040 or 2041 or even 2045. It's going to take a lot more efforts, a lot more work for us to get there here uh, that Henry Luce is talking about. Well, when World War II has ended, England goes through a major change. Their country is totally destroyed from World War II, guys. They're in a mess. And so the Labor Reform Union is going to take over England. And this group here is very socialist in their mindset. And they have to be because they've got to start from scratch to rebuild England. And one of the major issues here in England is going to be health care. There's a lot of people who are injured and hurt who needs medical attention during this time period. And England is going to go to socialized medicine. England is going to see more social, pro more social programs trying to help out the British people. Now, this is all put in place in 1945 to 1955. All right, it does work. It does stabilize England. In the 1980s, the new prime minister is Margaret, is Margaret Thatcher, and she does away with all these programs. So Margaret Thatcher kind of parallels Mr. Roosevelt. Mr. Roosevelt tries to save America during the Great Depression. Margaret, uh, the British try to save England after the war and Margaret Thatcher comes along and she starts making change take place to make it more of a democratic country than what it had once been. Of course, their health care continued on. That was not changed during this time period. Well, guys, in 1945, they fired Winston Churchill. The British people wanted the labor to be in charge of England and they got rid of Winston Churchill, the old conservative that helped them get through the war. And this really hurt Winston Churchill's feelings to have lost his job as prime minister. Now, he will get elected back in the prime ministry again in the 1950s. So there is redemption for Mr. Churchill. But during this time that he's down and out, feels rejected by the British people, he decides to come to America. He takes a grand tour of the country. And of course, he spends lots of time in New York and other places here while he's in 
the country. Well, he's going to go to Missouri in, Ma in March of 1946. He's going to go to the University of Missouri to make a speech. And his speech is going to deal with the Cold War. He's going to tell the people here in Missouri that a Cold War is now spreading across the world in which communism is going to try to destroy democracies. And democracies will try to destroy communism. And he says it's going to be a long, drawn-out battle here in what he called a Cold War. The Cold War is a, it's not going to be a fighting war. It's a war of ideologies. It's a war to test people's strength and their beliefs here during this time period. And Winston Churchill tells the American people that we have lost Eastern Europe. But at the treaty, at the Potsdam Treaty, and at the treaty uh, we had in, um, on the Caspian Sea, the, the, the Yalta Treaty, we had messed up. And of course, part of the problem was you had a president who was dying at Yalta, and he was not really paying attention to what was going on and said some things he should not have said. And then at Potsdam Conference, you're going to have a brand new president who has no clue of what's going on. And that's going to be Harry Truman. So Mr. Mr. Uh, Churchill tells us that these problems here have been have arrived because of poor planning and poor discussions that took place over here in the Eastern European countries and their safety after this war. We should have never have let Joseph Stalin take over these areas of Europe. And of course, we call these the satellite states. And he says these satellite states are going to be hampered from hearing the news from the West. He says that Joseph Stalin has put an iron curtain across Europe. This iron curtain is going to run through eastern Germany and go all the way down to the Mediterranean Sea. And all those countries that are west of, the, of Germany and are, and are east of Moscow and the Caspian Sea are the ones most affected by this huge iron curtain that's going to block communications to the people to let them know what is really going on. Okay, so his iron curtain speech is very important here, guys, in this time period. Now, another person who's rejected at the end of World War II is going to be Eleanor Roosevelt. She's been your first lady for 12 years, and all of a sudden, she has no job. She has spent a lot of time during the war, touring war-torn areas. She toured the Pacific. She toured Europe. She met with all these boys who've been wounded. She took letters back home for moms and dads to read. She mailed those boys letters for them. She was really a fantastic first lady, and she has no job, and Eleanor feels, feels rejected. Well, in, in, uh, in early 1945 in San Francisco, we're going to recommission a new league, a new League of Nations, trying to stop wars that is called the United Nations. And this time, the United States is going to be behind the formation of this organization. We realized that America had failed in 1919, that the Republican senators like Henry Cabot Lodge had dropped the ball and World War II could have been prevented if the League of Nations had included the United States. And this time we realize we've got to be a major power, a major influence behind a world organization that tries to, pre to prevent wars from happening through the United Nations. Well, they looked at Eleanor Roosevelt. Within the United Nations is a policy that deals with human rights trying to keep the human spirit alive across the world that is failing. And they put Eleanor Roosevelt in charge of the Human Rights Division of the United Nations. A very good job for her to be in. You know, I remember seeing Eleanor Roosevelt on television as a kid. I, rem I, I remember as far back as 1953 in my, in my personal memories. And I remember seeing her on television and, and her on the Jack Carr Tonight Show. Before Johnny Carson, there was Jack Carr. And he had her on pretty regularly. And she was on these news shows that are shown on Sunday mornings. And I saw Eleanor Roosevelt talking about trying to help the world. And I want to tell you something. She is, she became the first lady of the world. 
She got heavily involved in the medical supplies to third world countries, to worn torn countries. She helped get food supplies into these places. She helped get medicine into these places. So Eleanor Roosevelt, she tried to bring housing into these places. So Eleanor Roosevelt is a major champion for humanity in the 1940s, the 1950s, and the early 1960s. All right, she's the one who helped annihilate smallpox across the world. Smallpox was a major, major pandemic in the 1950s. We had a drug for it. We had medicine that would get rid of smallpox. I had my shot in 1957, and I still have the scar of my smallpox shot. And a lot of your parents and a lot of your grandparents, if you look on their left arm, you'll see a circle scar, and that's from your smallpox shot. Okay? By 1960, the world is totally done with smallpox. It's been eradicated. Smallpox has been conquered. By, 1950, by 1962, polio around the world has been annihilated. It's because this first lady got involved. She took ownership of her position. And with polio, she knew the effects of polio because her husband had it. And she knew how horrible this disease could be. So this first lady is going to be very important with the United Nations until 1962. In 1962, Eleanor Roosevelt is diagnosed with tuberculosis of the brain. And she died in early 1950, in early 1963. I remember when Eleanor died. She died just a few months before John Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. So Eleanor is a very important person during this time period. And I think that she should be maybe on the $20 bill. There's a lot of people, Harriet Tugman, the Underground Railroad uh, official and this of the, of the 1850s should be on one of the bills. I look at Margaret Sanger in birth control. She should be one on, on one of the bills. I look at Eleanor Roosevelt. She'd be a prime candidate to, to have her picture on a coin or on a bill of some kind. So it's interesting, you look at these women who made a difference here. Even Jane Addams should be on a, on a coin or a bill because these ladies are the heroes, the heroines of America. And I want you guys to realize how important Eleanor Roosevelt was in this time period, okay? Now, in Hollywood during this time period, you got a lot of actors and a lot of studio heads that have come out of Europe. Most of your studio heads had come out of Eastern Europe and uh, our, our, and, uh, our Western Russia. And they were considered to be a security threat to some people in America. And they looked at Hollywood as being a complete haven for communists. Now, this is all fakes. This is all false. And they start going after all these people that they think are communists. The Un-American Activities Committee is behind it. And we have what is called a Red Scare. We had one in 1919 after World War I. We're going to have one in 1946 to 1948 because of World War II. And they started inviting all these actors and all these actresses to come before Congress and testify if they knew or if they were a communist. If you, use the, if you use the freedom of speech on this, if you went through and, and said, you're not gonna answer this question, but you took the Fifth Amendment, in other words, you were blackballed. Hollywood disowned you. The FBI got involved to fully investigate you. And if you were not a legal person in America, if you had not passed your citizenship test, you could be deported. And a lot of your Hollywood screenwriters were involved here, guys, in this scandal because they thought they were writing movie scripts that is going to encourage the American kids to join the Communist Party. They said inside the movie were all these little messages that the kids would tune into and turn communist. It's a bunch of malarkey here, okay? And at these hearings, they brought in these Hollywood stars. They brought in Humphrey Bogart. They brought in Lauren McCall. They brought in Clark Gable. 
and, and Cary Grant. They brought in Ronald Reagan to be quizzed because he was a Hollywood actor during this time period. His wife was Jane, was Jane Wyman during this time period, and they brought her in. Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, the two dancers of the 1930s, they were brought in. So there's a lot of Hollywood stars who were brought in and questioned if they were or if they knew of a communist who lived in Hollywood. How crazy. And then they turned to the Hollywood heads of the, of the, of the different, the, uh, different uh, studios. People like Louis B. Mayer, the heads of 20th Century Fox, Jack Warner of Warner Brothers. These men are the ones who made movies during the 1930s that entertained America in the depths of the Great Depression. They did more to keep America stabilized and keep America whole than anybody else did in this time period. And here they're being accused of being communist. All right, do y'all know that Jack Warner took his colored movie cameras, the Technicolor movie cameras to the war in the Pacific? He took his directors, he took his film crews, and they were at Guadalcanal. They were at Irajima. They were in Guam. They were in Okinawa. And they filmed the war in color. And Jack Warner says, I'll make films of the war as it actually is taking place. And he put his cameraman in harm's way to make these movies. And he says, if one mama sees her son on these, on these movies here, these newsreels from World War II in the Pacific, if she sees her, if she sees her son, I have done my job. I let that mama know that her son is still alive. So it's interesting, guys. And they went through and persecuted these Hollywood directors, these Hollywood studio heads. And by the 1950s, they have totally done away with, they've totally destroyed Hollywood. Hollywood's gonna be made up of all kinds of new studios like, like New United Artists, and you'll start seeing movie studios like like uh, RKO Radio go out of business. You'll start seeing MGM, the great Metro Golden Mayor the, uh, studio, start start losing its clout and start seeing it be divided up. You'll, you'll see 20th Century Fox change hands. You'll see all kinds of things happen here in this time period. And some of your greatest movie stars of the 1930s and the 1940s who Americans looked up to in this war are destroyed. It is nothing more than a witch hunt because they were fearful that Hollywood was making films to turn the American young people into communists. They have lots of fear in the late 1940s, lots of fear during this time period. I also want you guys to realize we're going to a little recession after World War II. After war, you're going to a little recession as your industries begin to convert themselves from being war machines back to civilian machines, back to, to building consumer goods. And this is important because after World War II, you're gonna see all kinds of new items that are being produced here for the American people, like the microwave ovens, like the dryers that dries your clothes. Now you buy a, a clothes wash machine and a clothes dryer that are companion, they look just alike, and now you can wash your clothes and you can wash a load of clothes in 45 minutes and have those clothes dry within an hour. You'd have a load of clothes done in about two hours. And that's remarkable for this time period. It changed everything. You're going to start seeing the food industry change with frozen food like Swanson. And you're going to start seeing macaroni and cheese and chicken dinners and pills and, uh, and Philly cheese steaks and all this stuff being available to you in the grocery store in the frozen food section. You just simply unwrap them, put in your microwave oven or put in your regular oven, and you have instant gratification with your food. Here comes the FM radios. Here come the television sets. By 1960, you're gonna have color television sets that'll be on the market here. Your first major shows that were done in color were Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Color and Bonanza. Those are your first two big shows in 1960 were in color on the color TV sets, okay? 
So you start seeing these new consumer goods being produced because we convert over from being war machines back to being consumer goods. You know something, guys? Between 1940 or 1942, I should say, and to 1945, you could not buy a new car. There are no cars developed, manufactured, or sold during World War II. The fenders for cars during the war converted into propeller plants. They made propellers out of the material that we've used for fenders on cars. Ladies' lipstick made ammo for your machine guns and for, and for, your, and for your Tommy guns and all this kind of stuff. Watch cases are going to make artillery shells out of watch cases. Typewriters will be used to develop machine guns out of. So your everyday products that you had in 1940 becomes a war supply during the war. So in 1946 and 1947, here come your brand new cars, here come your brand new typewriters, here come your brand new trucks, here comes your lipstick again in those little containers. It's gonna change everything. So you've got, you got a feeling how America had to convert back over again after World War II. I want to tell you all a secret here, and you need to know this for your exam. In World War II, after the war, the biggest thing that changed America is going to be new technology. New technology from this war is going to change everything. We're going to get the computer after World War II. The microwave. You're going to get sonar and radar after World War II. You're going to start seeing nuclear fission that's being turned into, guys, nuclear medicine and nuclear submarines and nuclear power. So you're going to start seeing all these conversions being made here after World War II. And the technology is what made it happen. The number two thing you guys should remember is going to be cheap fuel, cheap energy. A gallon of gasoline in 1947 would cost you about eight cents a gallon. When I was a little boy around 1955, when I was about four years old, a gallon of gas cost 12 cents. In 1964, a gallon of gas would cost you about 17 cents. If my dad saw a gas station with gasoline at 20 cents a gallon, he called it highway robbery. I'm not going in there. I am not going to spend that kind of money for gasoline. Y'all should have seen him in 1974 when we had the oil embargoes and gasoline went over $2 a gallon. If gasoline price had continued on as it had in 1974, today your gasoline would be $15 a gallon. Thank God that didn't happen. Or we all be sitting on the side of the road waiting for a bus to show up or for a street car or for an Uber or somebody to take us somewhere because we couldn't afford to buy the gasoline. And you guys who got big trucks, y'all can't afford to pay $500 to fill your truck up with gasoline. It's just crazy. Okay. So guys, what powered America after World War II is going to be new technology and cheap energy. Y'all need to remember that because you're probably going to see this on your exam, uh, on your final exam here in class. Okay. Now, another concern of Hollywood during this time period was the people who were Jewish. A lot of your Hollywood stars, a lot of your Hollywood studios were, up, were, were made up of people from the Jewish race. And these folks want to bring back Israel. They want to bring back Israel. Okay. And part of the United Nations mission is to help reestablish Israel in an area of Palestine in which Israel had once existed. You know, guys, the Roman Empire destroyed Israel in the year 70 AD. They destroyed Israel because of all the trouble they had with a little set of people who called themselves Christians. And they marched in here in, the, in 70 AD and they destroyed the Jerusalem temple. This is the one that was built after, after uh, Nebuchadnezzar and all these guys were around. They destroyed the temple and they scattered the Jewish people all over Europe, all over Germany and Europe, England, France, the Netherlands, so forth, so on, Denmark, Poland, Persia, Russia. And these folks were scattered. 
after Adolf Hitler's atrocities toward these people, United Nations and Hollywood got heavily involved in trying to reestablish the country of Israel. Now, they did this extremely quickly. Uh, looking back at this time period, it might have been best they went in there first and established Palestine. Got the, got the, the Palestinian people into a border area, help them create a democracy of some kind, have some kind of laws to them so they could govern themselves and have open elections in the whole nine yards. And after a few years, bring in Israel, have them a, a border lined, lined up, you know, make sure that the, that the old city of Jerusalem could be in, been used by both groups of people. But it didn't happen that way. The Jewish people kind of just got thrown in here. And of course, the one country that was totally against the Jewish people being here is going to be Egypt. Egypt is going to make war against the Israelis here, guys. You'll have wars in the, night, in the late 1940s. There'll be a big war in 1956. There'll be a big war in 1966 between Egypt and Israel. There'll be another big war in the 1970s, 1972 to be exact. And you're gonna have all these different wars break out between Israel and Egypt. Jimmy Carter in 1978 tried to solve the problem. He brought the leader of Israel and the, and the leader of Egypt to the White House, or actually to Camp David. And for nine days, they discussed their issues. They discussed all kinds of ancient atrocities that they were trying to solve here. And these two men could not get along with each other. You had, you had Anwar Sadat and you had uh, Begin of Israel. And these two men could not agree on anything. Jimmy Carter spent more time trying to break up fights than having discussions here in this time period. And finally, after nine days, they signed an agreement to eventually in the future revisit again and try to have a peace treaty between the two countries. And this treaty has never happened. We're still out there the way it was in 1948. Okay, so guys, the United States gets heavily involved in trying to reestablish Israel in 1948. Okay, there's going to be problems out here. As a matter of fact, the Arab people did not like it. And they form what is called the Arab League. The Arab League is against Israel being where it's located. The Arab League is made up of Libya. That's where Tripoli is. It's made up of Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq. And they are totally against Israel being here. And they called themselves the Arab League. In the early 1970s, in that war between Egypt and Israel, the 1972 war, the United States backed up Israel. We gave them brand new F-4 jets to fight. The Egyptians had Russian MiGs. We always thought the Russian aircraft were superior to the American aircraft. And those F-4 Phantoms shot those MiGs out of the air as if they were nothing. And we realized that our air force, our air supply was superior to the Russians during this time period. But the offset is the Arab League is going to cause an oil embargo that's going to affect the American economy starting in 1973 and 1974. We're gonna see, whole, we're gonna see big, huge oil increases the price of gasoline, the price of fuel oil for your homes will go up. People can't pay it. You'll start seeing inflation start in America. By the time that Jimmy Carter leaves office, the inflation is 17% across America. If you want to buy a new house in 1979, your interest rate would be close to 15%. Why do you think your grandmas and grandpas refinanced their homes in 1995 
when Bill Clinton got the interest rate on housing down to below 8%. And they saved thousands of dollars by refinancing in the mid-1990s. Okay? So there's consequences to what you do here in this, in this war, this modern world that we're entering into here that's going to be centered mostly around terrorism. Okay? So guys, Israel is reestablished in 1948. The Arab League is formed during this time period to help concentrate their efforts toward hindering or putting down Israel. Okay? And by the way, the, the, uh, the Arab League is still with us. Their big league now is called OPEC, the oil producing countries of the world. And so <clears throat> there they have the influence today more so than the Arab League did in the 40s and the 1950s. Okay? Now, in March of 1947, there's a major problem. It looks like that Greece and Turkey are going to join the Soviet Union. It looks like that Joseph Stalin is going to take two areas of the world in which we want to control. Okay? Strategically, these two countries are important in a Cold War. The United States will send over $400 million to these two countries to guarantee their democracies will be upheld. The Central Intelligence Agency that was formed during this time period is going to send agents in here to make sure the Soviets do not take over these two countries. By 1950, both, both, both Turkey and Greece will have American military bases on their soil. And actually, guys, in the early 1960s, we have nuclear weapons that are pointing directly to Moscow. It is 1,500 miles from, from Istanbul to Moscow. During 1962, the Soviet Union tried to put nuclear weapons on the island of Cuba. Cuba went communist in 1959 with Fidel Castro. He aligned himself with the Soviet Union. Our U-2 spy planes in 1961 started seeing construction of nuclear silos in Cuba. By October of 1962, these silos are completed and Russia is transporting nuclear warheads to Cuba. And we have this major Cuban missile crisis that takes place in this time period. It's only 1,500 miles from Havana to Washington, D.C. So it's tit for tat in this Cold War that is getting hot over nuclear weapons, these nuclear missiles. John Kennedy keeps a clear head in 1962. He talks to Nikita Khrushchev, the head of the Soviet Union, and Nikita Khrushchev realizes that a nuclear war was not worth it over the island of Cuba. And John Kennedy promised to take nuclear weapons out of Turkey. So you see what's happening here, guys, in this Cold War. You're always being threatened with nuclear annihilation at any given time. And it's not a good way to live. You're always fearful of what's going to happen on the other side of the world if their computers have a glitch to them and all of a sudden they launch nuclear weapons toward the United States or vice versa. It's a big problem. And also to add to the problem, in the 1960s, China began to build nuclear weapons. And they had their aim toward Russia and toward the United States. You got a three-way competition going on here in the 1960s and 1970s. And it's going to turn into a very, very troublesome time for the American people. We're always worried if we would be awakened in the middle of the night by a nuclear war. And that concerned people. And people were very much a, a, a aware of what could happen here, guys, if somebody shot off nuclear weapons. And it's going to be a big mess here. Okay. When we go through and we start spending money to save Turkey and Greece, this policy is called a policy of containment. We're trying to find a way to contain communism and do not let it spread around the world. You know, this could have been solved in 1945. If the Allied forces had left Germany and went to Poland 
and went right to Moscow by December of 1945. We'd have destroyed Russia and we destroyed communism. And that had kept us from having a communist nation of China and a communist nation of North Korea. It made a big difference here, guys. But Mr. Truman has put his money on containment. You know, I tell the History One class, they try to contain slavery and trying to find a way to keep slavery from spreading out of Texas. And now the big question here is what we do with the, with the free country that's opened up the Mexican War. We allow slavery to expand here. They try the policy of containment. Containment leads to war. It leads to war. Okay. You know, one of the things too about Mr. Truman that I have not mentioned before to you guys is the system put in place during the Second World War. We had a we had a policy called the, the, the industrial military complex or the military industrial complex. The military gets in with industry to design and build war machines in which Congress is not really aware of, but they pay for it. The American people pay for what the military wants the industries, the industries to build, which means they're in bed with each other. And these industrialists realize that war and the threat of war guarantees them a good profit. President Eisenhower will warn the American people in 1961 in his farewell address to the American people, and he warns us about the military industrial complex, that they'll want war after war after war to make more money. It's gonna be a big problem. It's still going on today, guys. It's still part of today's system here, the military industrial complex, okay? Now, in June of 1947, George Marshall, General George Marshall, is going to have a plan to rebuild Europe. We're not going to make the same mistake we made in, in the 1920s. We're going to appropriate $17 billion to rebuild Western Europe. We're gonna put a lot of money into England and France. We put a lot of money into West Germany. East Germany went to the Soviets. West Germany went to the Allies. We're gonna spend money rebuilding Italian factories in the northern parts of Italy. We're gonna spend money helping out the Dutch rebuild Amsterdam and their part of the world. We're gonna help Belgium and Luxembourg. We're gonna help Denmark. All those countries affected by Adolf Hitler's lightning war in 1940, in early 1940, we're going into those areas to help rebuild them. My professor at Troy, my history class at Troy, was a tail gunner on a B-17 bomber out of North Africa. And he told us in class that how he would go through and write down on, a, on his notepad in his diary uh, what they bombed in Northern Italy. And he said by 1953, he marked off the last factory that they had bombed. The Marshall Plan had rebuilt. We totally rebuilt Europe with the Marshall Plan. Okay. But we also realize that Eastern Europe is hurting. We have got to find a way to get behind the Iron Curtain to help people. And what we did was we started a broadcast system. It is called Radio Free Europe. We started broadcasting Western news to the people who live in those Soviet states, those Soviet satellite states. We're going to, to present them with European soccer games on the radio. They'll hear American football, American golf, American tennis, American baseball. Yes, the World Series was broadcasted live across Eastern Europe during this time period. They knew who Elvis was in the 1950s. They heard American broadcasting, American music, and all the entertainment that America had to offer. We gave the people of Eastern Europe a hope that one day that they would split from, from Soviet Russia. You know, Joseph Stalin tried to block all this stuff. 
you know, the Marshall Plan was completed by 1951. Joseph Stalin did not live to see his country rebuilt after World War II. He died in 1953. Nikita Khrushchev in 1965 saw the ending of the reconstruction of those 75,000 villages of the Scorch Earth policy and trying to get homes for 25 million people who were refugees during World War II. So he's trying to block all this stuff because he's afraid that his states would try to revolt and go back with the allies in Europe. One country tried this in 1956. Czechoslovakia had an uprising. And the Soviet Union will send tanks into Czechoslovakia and put down this rebellion. And the people of Europe realize, the people of Eastern Europe realize it's going to be a long struggle before they see major change happen. It's going to be 1988, 80, 89 time period before a change comes in to these areas of the world. It's a long time waiting. A lot of people died as old folks hoping for a change. Luckily, their grandkids will see the change take place in this time period. Okay, so you have Radio Free Europe during this time period. Also in this time period, Doug MacArthur over in Japan will have them reconstruct. We dropped two nuclear bombs on Japan. They're in terrible shape. We got to go in there and rebuild the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We got to go in there and help those people out. You know, I have a, I had a student at Holbrook in the Air Force that told me that his grandmother lived in the city of Nagasaki and was there when the bomb was dropped. She survived, but it changed her DNA. And him and his cousins and his moms and dads and aunts and uncles have had some major issues with their health that's continued on from the nuclear explosion that took place here in August of 1945. That this young girl, this young lady, is going to marry an Air Force officer and come to America as his bride and produce a family whose DNA has been altered by a nuclear weapon. Do y'all know this pandemic is going to alter our DNA? The drugs they come up with to go through and, and, and make us immune to this virus is going to change our DNA, and we don't know how it's going to change it. Your, your grandkids might have one blue eye and one green eye. Who knows? It's going to be interesting to see what transpires out of this, out of this pandemic, because it does change the body. It, change your, it changes your nuclear structure inside your body here, guys, your DNA. Okay? MacArthur is going to help reconstruct Japan. But here's what MacArthur tells Harry Truman. He says, you've got to put money into China. The Chinese people are hurting. They were our allies in this war. They fought with us, with us against Japan. You've got to get money into China. If you don't, there's going to be dire consequences. Guess who got denied? Guess who nobody was concerned with was China. And in 1949, China becomes communist. And from 1949 until 1972, we have no relations with China. And China is a nuclear threat during half of this time period. Okay? So go, guys, when Chow comes in as a, as a head of the, of the Communist Party, he tells the Chinese people, who are hurting from this war, if you make me your leader, I will give you land, food, and medicine. When you have people who are struggling and do not have a way to feed themselves or house themselves or keep themselves healthy, they will turn to anybody that will promise them relief. And you got to be very careful of this. The same thing will happen in North, in North Korea. It's going gonna, it's gonna to sponge on down into Vietnam by the, by the late, by the mid-1950s. So, guys, we should have gone into China in 1947. Like we did Europe, put another 10 or 15 or $20 billion, 
into it and help rebuild their civilization. We could afford, we could have afforded guys to spend thirty billion dollars on rebuilding the world. The only thing about it is we should have got the war completed and then rebuilt the world. But our leaders had other ideas. They had other agendas during this time period. Okay. All right. Now, here's another interesting thing I want you guys to realize that happened. During the Potsdam Conference in 1945, they decided to divide, to divide the city of Berlin into two parts. The western side of Berlin would go to the Allies. The eastern part of Berlin would go to the Russians. But Germany was split in half. West Germany went to the Allies and East Germany went to the Russians. Berlin is 85 miles inside of East Germany. It's like a hanger in a pen. Anything happened in West Berlin, a whole new war could have broken out really easy. Well, here's what's interesting, guys. During the Marshall Plan, the people of West Europe, of, of Western Germany, got all kinds of great supplies. They got medicine, they got all kinds of consumer goods, refrigerators, stoves, TV sets, radios. They made out like bandits here. And these items were put on trucks and transported to the people of West Berlin, who are part of the Allies. Well, these people in West Berlin began to buy two of each item and carry it to their family members who lived in East Berlin. Russia could not afford to send consumer goods in East Berlin during this time period. And they got mad because the people of West Berlin were given the people of, Earth, of East Berlin all these wonderful consumer goods that Russia could not provide. And they were worried about an uprising taking place in East Berlin that would lead into West, that would lead into East Germany, and then go across the satellite states. So they decide, Moscow decided here, guys, that they are going to shut down the Autobahn to all the trucks that go into West Berlin. This is the 24th of June, 1948. 24th of June, 1948. This is called the Berlin Blockade. Okay. Well, guys, over in, over, in West, over in West Germany, we had all kinds of equipment that was left over from the war. We had B-17 bombers. We had those old C-47 cargo planes. We had, we had those C-54 cargo planes. And we just simply went through and re-engined them and got everything kind of cleaned up on those airplanes, worked on hydraulics and all this stuff, got back in a first class position, and we started flying the goods to West Berlin and dared the Soviets to shoot a plane down. Do y'all know that we transported over two million tons of goods in the Berlin airlift? And the kids, of, the kids of West Germany saw the American flyboys as their heroes. You know, if you're a pilot on one of these planes, you don't spend a whole lot of time on the airplane except just flying it. Oh, you do go and do the ground check and all this stuff, but the load master is the one who loads up the airplanes. Once you do your ground check and kick the tires and all this kind of stuff and get on board the airplane and test the ailerons and the, and, the, and the rudder and all your instruments here, make sure they're all working correctly and all your services are working correctly, you take off. And you fly to Berlin, you land the airplane, you do your post-flight check, and you have like four hours, you just stand around and have nothing to do. You're waiting on the load master at the plane unloading. And here come those German boys, those little German girls. And they started going to the fences and the American boys would go over there and talk to and pick at these children. And these fly boys realized that these kids need a treat. And so they'd go to the commissary in these German towns they flew out of and they would load their flight bag full of candy. Hershey, Hershey candy bars, bubble gum, lollipops, all day suckers, you name it, they put in those bags. 
and they would go to the fences and spend those four hours giving those kids out candy and talking to them. And it's amazing how many friends were made in, in West Berlin by the American Fly Boys. Well, guys, Russia could not compete with this area. There was no way they could compete with it. And so on May the 12th, 1949, just a year later, just barely a year later, Russia reopened the Autobahn. They reopened the Autobahn. But they also built a barbed wire fence with a checkpoint Charlie and on different streets to inspect what goes into East Berlin. They shut off the appliances, the TV sets, the radios that were going to East Berlin. The people did not have them. Okay? In 1961, when John Kennedy was president, they're going to build the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall will block off East Berlin from West Berlin. This was done as the Cold War was getting hot. They're almost heading for a nuclear war here in the early 1960s. Okay? And so, guys, these folks here build the Berlin Wall. It will not come down until the late 1980s when George Walker Bush is your president. George H.W. Bush is your president when the wall comes down. It goes up with John Kennedy. It comes down with Mr. Bush in the late 1980s. Okay? All right. Harry Truman, during this recession period, is going to start what is called the Fair Deal. Harry Truman does not have the New Deal. He has a Fair Deal. He's trying to deal with labor unrest. He's trying to deal with housing. When all these boys come home from war, they need housing. He's also is the first president who looks at segregation. He's your first president that realizes that soldiers, that black American soldiers are being persecuted in, at home and there's no need in this. I read the story about a young man in Mobile, Alabama, who served during World War II and got all kinds of medals. He came home and got a job on the docks at Mobile that required him to work during the nighttime. He got off work at four o'clock in the morning from the docks in Mobile and had to walk home. And every night going home, the Mobile police harassed him because he was a black man. And he said that oftentimes when he got home, he broke down and cried because he served his country and got all these wonderful medals for his work, and yet he's belittled and mistreated by the Mobile Police Department. There's a young man in South Carolina that they beat him so bad he went blind. And when Harry Truman heard this, that's when he got involved here, guys, with irrigation and trying to find ways to, to end this problem. As a matter of fact, guys, during World War II, we had over 247 racist incidents across the country, across the country. We had 50 cities that regularly had a race riot. And the two biggest cities were Chicago and Detroit. They had the most. This is when Langston Hughes wrote, how much longer does America fight Hitler and Jim Crow? Because Jim Crow and Hitler are the same thing here. Okay, in 1946, Harry Truman is going to have a special, a special group formed. It's going to come out of the State Department and it's called the President's Committee on Civil Rights. This is 1946. The next year, Jackie Robinson begins to play for the Brooklyn Dodgers. So you start to see change take place here. On July the 26th, 1948, now this is election year. Harry Truman is running for re-election as a Democrat. And here on July the 26th, 1948, Harry Truman is going to issue an executive order is order number 9981, 9981. Executive order 80, 9981 is going to make 
the military and the and the uh, um, oh my goodness, my civil service is going to make the military and civil service enforce a new law toward segregation. I should say toward integration. Mr. Truman is going to write the executive order 9981 that says that the, that, the, that the civil service and the military will no longer have segregation. He's killing Jim Crow and the government here in this time period. Okay. This full integration will take place on October the 30th, 1954. Yeah, it took six years to make this happen. A lot of your military men will leave the armed forces because they said they would not live in the same housing or eat from the same table that black Americans did. Y'all know in World War II, the blood supply was kept separate between black soldiers and white soldiers. And Harry Truman is bringing all this to an end. He says it is time for the military to be totally integrated along with civil service. So your postal system, your federal court systems, anything that's a federal government here, guys, we totally, is going to be totally integrated by 1954. This is a big step here. You know, because of this, that a bunch of men in South Carolina left the Democratic Party, Storm Thurmond, a senator in this time period, is going to have established what is called the Dixiecrats. The Dixiecrats are a political party that goes against the Democratic Party because they feel like that Mr. Truman was a traitor to the South by doing this action, this executive order. It's during this time period that your state, your Southern states start flying the Confederate flags again. And the Deep South voted for Storm Thurmond who ran as a Dixiecrat during the election of 1948. People said that Mr. Truman could not win re-election, but he did. Oh, Dewey ran against him and Dewey thought he could just go through making about 10 speeches across the country and get, the, and get the vote because of Truman's action toward civil rights in the government. And he was wrong. The American people were getting ready for a change to take place. And Harry Truman was reelected as or was elected by as your president. This is his first time being elected as president. Remember, he's vice president for Harry Truman. So he filled out the four years of Harry Truman and got four more years of his own during this time period. Okay, so this executive order was very important here in this time period. Okay. Oh, by the way, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, this organization is trying to find court cases to overturn the Plessy case of 1896. In the 1930s, they hired a new lawyer whose name was Thud Good Marshall. And Mr. Marshall is looking for court cases in education, trying to overturn the Plessy case. And in 1948, he found one, the University of Missouri's Law School. This law school, allowed black students to attend the classes here, but they had no rights in class. They could not defend a case. They could not argue in class against the other white kids about legal traditions and legal precedents. They were forced to sit in the back of the classroom. They were treated as second-class citizens and a first-class university that taught law. The thing that got them in trouble is this. They were not separate but equal. The Plessy case said you had to be separate but equal, and they got them at the library. The good marshal went to the library and saw where all these white kids were in there, but he was denied entry to the library because he was a black man. And those law students who were African American had no access to the library. I want to tell you, if you go to law school, You've got to have that library. When I was working on my little, my little manuscript on Southern Airways, they had a lawsuit in 1950 by a bus company. A bus company wanted to buy airplanes to start an airline company over Mississippi. And Southern got sued. So I went to the law school there at Ole Miss to look up this court case. 
I went up there about 10 o'clock in the afternoon, 10 o'clock in the evening, and that place was crazy. Couldn't hardly get in the place. Went back two days later, about six in the morning, and it was still crazy in that law library. Those kids had to live in that law library to get to the law school at Ole Miss, and they do have one of the best law schools in the country. And I finally got my stuff that I needed. I finally got to a coffee machine and got my stuff copied and got the hell out of the place, and I didn't go back. I said, this is totally crazy here doing all this stuff, okay? And Mr. Marshall is going to use that library as his example of Missouri not being separate but equal, and he won the court case. They told Missouri they had two choices, integrate that law library or build another library identically to it. Same floor plan, same books, same bookcases, the whole nine yards. And Missouri realized that they could not afford to do it. And so they integrated their law school. So you're starting to see these baby steps taking place here. All during the 1940s, Good Good Marshall is trying to find court cases that involve public schools. And by 1950, he had 12 different cases that he put together under one case. The case he put it under is called Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. And he's going to head here, guys, to the Supreme Court in a few years. So, guys, this integration situation here is very important. Harry Truman is going to have a place in which they're going to discuss civil rights as a cabinet in a cabinet function in the presidency. In 1948, he declares the military and civil service will be integrated. You're starting to see baby steps take place here, guys, uh, in this time period. Okay. It's going, to be, it's going to be not too much longer in which the Brown case will actually go to the Supreme Court. Okay? Now, another interesting situation is going to be taking place in Europe. After we get Europe pretty much rebuilt, we realize that European security is our number one agenda, our number one issue. That we've got to find a way to make sure that the European nations, the allied European nations, are protected from Soviet threat. So in 1948, we're going to form what is called NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. NATO is going to go across Europe, and these different countries will join NATO, including Canada, the United States. And in the NATO agreement, we are saying, that if any of these nations are attacked by a Soviet force or by a Soviet satellite state, we have all been attacked. And these NATO countries will see the presence of the United States Air Force, which is formed in 1948, and also by the United States Army. We are now in a new policy of reconstruction in which we bring in the military to keep a presence to stabilize Europe. We realize if we don't do this, you could have another Adolf Hitler. We have got to keep a way to make sure that Europe is stabilized in this time period. Well, this is in 1949, we created NATO. In 1955, the Soviet Union is going to create what is called the Warsaw, the Warsaw Pact. The Warsaw Pact says if the Allies should attack any of the Russian satellite states, they've all been attacked. So now you have these two military forces that are trying to compete in Europe during this time period. You got to realize, guys, that George Washington told us the truth in 1796. He says, if you ever go to Europe, to a European war, you're going to inherit Europe to take care of. And we are still in that position. We are still with NATO in these countries. And since the Soviet Union has collapsed, a lot of these Eastern European countries have joined NATO. They have come more Western, Westernized than, than anybody else has been during this time period. And they love the American culture. They love the European culture. 
and these kids travel to America and our kids travel to Poland. They travel to, to Prague. They travel to all these different areas here, guys, to study their culture. You guys go to a major university and they offer an overseas study program and you qualify for it, y'all better jump on it. I'm telling you, you better jump on it. You have you a chance to see things and experience and experience cultures that you never would have dreamed of before if you had just done it. Okay? All right. In September 1949 is when Mao Zedong is going to take over China. He brings in the Communist Party. King Kai-shek, a free China, is forced to go to Taiwan. Taiwan is free China, where the mainland China becomes communist here. Okay? Now, guys, in 1945, we exploded three nuclear weapons. We exploded one in Alamogordo, New Mexico, to make sure the weapons actually worked. We sent one to the island of Timian, where Paul Tibbets flew that plane across the city of Hiroshima and dropped the first nuclear weapon. It worked. The second weapon was shot off about three days later, and it worked. And we have no more atomic weapons. It'll take us up to six months to develop more nuclear weapons. And, China, and Japan was convinced that we had a whole arsenal of them. Okay? We figured in 1945, that it'd take the Soviet Union at least 15 years or longer to develop a nuclear weapon. They did it in four years. In 1949, the Soviet Union has a nuclear weapon. In the early 1950s, China has their nuclear weapon. Okay? And here in the United States, we believe that somebody has sold nuclear secrets to the Soviets. Now, in 1947, when we go through and redo the military, we create what is called the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense will have also under it the Civil, the Central Intelligence Unit. That's the spy network. <clears throat> we also will have the nuclear secrets in all of this stuff and we'll have nuclear plans for the, the nuclear or the Atomic Commission, the, the Nuclear Commission for, for Atomic Weapons and so forth. And we figure that somebody involved with the Manhattan Project had sold these secrets to the Soviet Union. The FBI gets in charge of it. J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, says that he always gets his man. That's not true. He always gets a person. And most of the time, the person is not guilty of what he's being charged for. And the FBI is going to decide that the person who sold the nuclear secrets without real evidence is going to be Julius Rosenberg. They charged Julius Rosenberg and his wife Ethel with selling nuclear weapons, or selling, selling nuclear secrets, I should say, to the Soviet Union. There's no proof of it. It's all fake news. It's all made up. They've got to get somebody to make sure the American people feel safe in this time period. This is the craziest thing you ever heard of. You know, they went through and got his family members. They got her family members and they threatened them. The FBI told them how they should testify in court. They did not do it. They would go to prison also. They blackmailed the two, the two, the two people's families. <clears throat> And they were found guilty, guys, of selling nuclear secrets to the Soviet Union. And on June the 19th, 1953, June the 19th, 1953, these individuals will go to the electric chair at Sing Sing. They'll be executed for selling nuclear secrets to the Soviet Union. We found out in the 1970s they had nothing to do with it. We found all this out when Hoover died. He died in 1972. You know, you want to read about a dictator in America and a man who tried to make sure that he had complete control of America and he had more power than any of the presidents had because he had secrets on them too. They said he had a stack 25 feet high that just dealt with Eleanor Roosevelt. He hated the Kennedy boys. And when he died, we found out what Mr. Hoover was up to. 
It's a strange story of Mr. Hoover. It turns out that Mr. Hoover was homosexual and he was a pedophile homosexual. Him and his partner, his partner who was the secretary at the FBI, they lived together in a mansion up in, up in Maryland and they had little houseboys who were 13 and 14 years old. He blackmailed people to keep himself from being blackmailed. It's really crazy in this time period. It's really, really crazy of how these people operated in this time period. Okay, so guys, here you have the trial of Julius Rosenberg and the whole thing was a farce. The whole thing would be illegal today. And it's hard to imagine how these people are acting here. And then here comes the worst of them all. His name is Joseph McCarthy. Now, if you guys go to your Blackboard video collection that I put on here for you, you will see the film clips that deals with Joseph McCarthy. And I think you guys need to watch them. Y'all need to see what happened here in these witchcraft trials of the early 1950s. Joseph McCarthy begins a communist witch hunt in the United States State Department. This is February of 1950. He tells the American press corps who meets in a bar in downtown Washington, D.C. in the early afternoons, they drink until the evening times, they all go get dinner and then they all go home from there. Just McCarthy told these press corpsmen that he knew of 500 people in the State Department who were communists. And he's going to employ J. John, I mean, he's going to employ, employ J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI to investigate the situation. Then he brings in a well-known attorney, an attorney general actually out of New York, whose name is Roy Kahn. That's Bill C-O-H-N. Roy Kahn is a secret homosexual. Mr. Hoover is gay, and people question. Mr. McCarthy, he was married, but all during these trials, something crazy was going on at home. His wife showed up one week on crutches. The next week, she had her arm in a cast. It's like, what in the hell is going on at the McCarthy house? Are they trying to kill each other at night? What is going on here with these two goons in this time period? Y'all know that Roy Kahn is going to go into bathrooms in the State Department and solicit to men in the bathrooms. That's how he went through and got a whole large number of gay men expelled from the State Department. These folks didn't have a voice during this time period. And if you were gay in the 1950s and your employer found out that you were gay, they fired you. They fired you. If you went to a gay bar in this time period and they got raided by, raided by the police, which is a very common occurrence, the police would put your name in the newspaper and the next morning you were fired from your job. Gay men had to learn how to go through and make their own little societies in their apartments and in their homes to have, to have parties just for themselves and don't allow anybody else in here. And a lot of these men of this time period were veterans of World War II. They found each other in World War II. Dad told me, he says, we knew who the gay guys were in our divisions. Said they'd go off together and do their own things. They'd go to London together and do their own things. And said, we were not bothered by them because we were not involved with them. And he says, you know, it was not a big deal. And on these Navy ships and the Marine Corps, these young men from across the country discovered each other. They thought they were the only person in town who had these secret feelings. Got into World War II and decided to find out there's a whole bunch of them, about 10% of the soldiers that had same-sex feelings. And so these men began to band together here in the 1950s and form their own little communities. If you go to your blackboard, you'll see a whole series of films clips that deal starting with the 1920s going up to the 19 or up to 2000 about gay history. And these little film clips are like 20, 15, 20 minutes long. 
and he explains to you how these folks form their communities. You know, I want to tell you something, guys. I don't just teach white man's history. I try to bring everybody to the picture. And I think it's the best way to go because I want you guys to understand that history is a complicated event, a, a complicated issue. If you do not realize, you do not realize how people have got where they are today, they could lose their freedoms and go back to the way it was 200 years ago. 200 years ago. We can't afford to do that. We've come too far, guys, to go backwards here in this time period. Okay? MacArthur is going after black Americans in the State Department. He fires them. He goes after women in the State Department. They fire them. He goes after immigrants in the State Department. They fire them too. They go to the gays and lesbians in the State Department and they fire them also. And the two men who are doing all the investigating are gay men. That's what's so crazy. Why would they do this? It's like Adolf Hitler. He was bisexual and he killed homosexuals. But yet he had young boys and young, and young soldiers in his company. It just doesn't make any sense here. And how many of these people did, did Ray Cohen sleep with in this time period, then turn around the next morning and turn them in? You get an idea how bad it is. And speaking of Roy Cohn, after all of this witchcraft trials, he goes back to New York City and becomes a major lawyer. His client is the father of Donald Trump. Roy Kahn is the man who told Donald Trump's father ways to make sure that black Americans could not rent his property in the 1970s. Roy Kahn says you don't go through and tell the truth all the time. You make the truth up, you should go alone. If you keep repeating the same lies over and over again, it'll turn into the truth. And you use the news media to help you spread your falsehoods. He's a master at this. You know that Roy Kahn got sick in the 1980s. He told the American people that he had cancer. He died in the early 1990s. And when the autopsy was released, he had died from full-blown AIDS. Roy Kahn is a history study just in himself and how he acted. Jagger Hoover is a history lesson just in itself. Joseph McCarthy is a history lesson just into itself. Once he got the State Department cleaned out, he went after the Army. He said the United States Army was full of communists. This is 1953. And he brought generals and lieutenant colonels and all these folks, majors. He brought all these folks into Congress to testify if they were or if they knew a communist in the United States Army. It got so crazy here, guys, that CBS News and NBC News decided to broadcast the hearings on television. One day, CBS carried the program all day. The next day, NBC carried it. And the American people saw firsthand how ruthless McCarthy was. And one of the men who helped him was a senator whose name was Richard Nixon. Nixon got in with Roy Kahn and also got in with McCarthy and Mr. Hoover. And we know what the quit led Mr. Nixon and got him into trouble. Lying to the American people. Falsehoods. Trying to change the truth. The whole nine yards. Okay? The American people will not put up with it. You'll see get presidents get elected out of office because of the way they conduct themselves. Okay, so it's going to be interesting here, guys, as we continue into this history program of all these men trying to get through things by using the media and trying to bring falsehoods through the media here in this time period. You know, guys, in 1954, President Eisenhower got tired of all this mess, and Congress censored McCarthy. They made him stop. They made him stop. The very next day, he told the American people, I'm going after more communists in America. He did not learn his lesson. 
the man has a serious problem with alcohol. And in 1956, Joseph McCarthy is going to die from cirrhosis of the liver. He literally drunk himself to death. Okay. Richard Nixon is vice president by this time. And Roy Kahn has gone back to New York City to do his mischief in New York City. Okay, it's interesting. And then, of course, the biggest problem for Harry Truman is going to come in 1950. In June of 1950, the Korean War begins. The policy of, of containment has not worked. To try to keep the North, the North Koreans out of the South, the North Koreans invaded the South. By the time the United Nations got an army together with the Americans heading up the army, the general in charge was Doug MacArthur. By the time MacArthur and the, and, the, and the UN American army gets to South Korea, the whole country is almost infiltrated. It's gonna take us several months of heavy fighting to push the North Koreans above the demilitarized zone the zone that we're still watching after today to make sure the North does not cross over. And this war turns into a stalemate. This war is being plagued by low supplies. The soldiers of, of the Korean War were the young men from poor families across America. And these boys will have a problem with alcohol from this war. The food supply did not get through very regularly, but the liquor did. If you're in cold weather and you start drinking, you can be in some serious trouble up here in this time period. Okay? The Korean War is going to be a war in which we stalemate in the war in the spring of 1951. On April the 10th, 1951, MacArthur has flown to Washington, D.C. to talk to the president. And he tells President Truman that we have got to make a war going against the Chinese. The Chinese are backing up the North Koreans. If we go into China, we can get rid of communism in China in a matter of weeks. Because they're not fully stabilized here after two years of being in power, the communists are still not in full control yet. There are still pockets of resistance here in China. What did Truman do when MacArthur told him we need to go to China? He fired him. He fired the general that won the Pacific War in World War II. The audacity to fire this general because he disagreed about the problems here in Korea and in China. Okay? When Harry Truman fired MacArthur, his popularity dropped down to 23%. 23% said that Harry Truman was doing a good job as the president. That's pretty sad here, guys. That's really bad. On July, in July of 1953, the Korean War is going to end. Well, actually, it's in a stalemate. It's still going on officially. It has not ended. 142,000 American boys died in this war. 142,000 American boys died here in a war that has not, has not been ended. This war cost America $100 billion to fight. $100 billion to fight. Well, guys, on April, the, I mean, sorry, on, Ju on January the 20th, 1953, Dwight Eisenhower became the new president. And that played a lot into the ending of this war because they knew that he was a mastermind of D-Day. If he got his way, he could take North Korea off of the, out of the world completely, wipe them completely off the earth. And he'd go invade China and take them pretty quickly too. And that's why these enemies of our time at this time period decided on armistice, because they realized that they could not compete against a general in the, in the might of General Eisenhower. What, whatever Eisenhower wanted to do, the American people would be behind him, because he was the mastermind of D-Day. My father was a very big Eisenhower fan, because he met him in World War II. And Dad loved Eisenhower. 
And I still believe the last great president in American history has been Dwight Eisenhower. He's the last great president that we've had in American history. But he made some mistakes, but he also ran the country as his hero would have ran it, ran it, and his hero was George Washington. That's why he gave a farewell of speech to the American people in January of 1961 to warn us about inside threats, to be careful, just like Washington warned us in 1796 about inside threats and outside threats, okay? It's really important you realize all this is going on here in this time period, okay? In 1954, the Oliver Brown case is gonna to come to the American Supreme Court. Now, here's what's interesting about this situation. In 1953, the Chief Justice, the old conservative, Republican Chief Justice is going to die. And President Eisenhower gets to choose the new Chief Justice. And the man he chose is going to be Earl Warren, the former Attorney General of California. Earl Warren is a man who instigated the POW camps for the, for the Japanese Americans. He ran for governor in 1946, won it, and during this election, people in California wanted to have segregation among all groups of Californians. They wanted to go through and build three public school systems. One for Black American, Hispanic Americans. He, they wanted one for Asian American kids and one for white kids. And Earl Warren says, no, we are the American people. We are one people, and I will not have three separate schools. We're not going to turn ourselves into an area that's worse than the American Southeast. And in 1953, President Eisenhower is going to select Earl Warren as a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And he is going to hear the Brown case. Okay, this is very important that y'all realize this. Earl Warren is going to say that separate but equal is a fallacy. It cannot happen. It will not happen. It will not work. So therefore, I find the Plessy case is being totally unconstitutional and shall not be henceforth be enforced because you're not having separate but equal facilities for all the kids in America that are going to school. And he tells the federal judges across the country, a lot of these judges were appointed by Roosevelt, a lot of them were appointed by Harry Truman. And he told these federal judges, I want you to immediately enforce this law. I want integration of schools to take place, just like the integration of the civil service and the military has just been completed. If they can do it, you can do it too. And he says that segregation, segregation deprives black American children of equal protection under the law. And he says that I want to bring back the guarantees of the 14th Amendment. You know, that's disenfranchised with the Plessy case. And now he's reinforcing the 14th Amendment that says American citizens are equal under the law, regardless of creed, color, or national origin. that they are all created equal. And he says the doctrine of separation between the races has no place in public education. Well, guys, when Eisenhower becomes president, he has to go through and appoint some federal judges. And these old judges won't, won't go through and stand up for what Earl Warren has told them to do here, guys, on May the 17th, 1954. It's going to be the new judges who looks at the law. And this will not happen until 1957. A federal judge in Little Rock, Arkansas, decides to enforce the, decides to enforce the Brown case in the state of Arkansas. And one of your big schools in Little Rock was Central High School. And he issued the order that this high school shall be integrated in the fall of 1957. The governor, an old, unreconstructed Southerner, 
an old demagogue, if you will, told the people of Arkansas, the people of Little Rock, that you got to save your school or these black children are going to overtake your school and your white kids will be disenfranchised. He totally believes in white supremacy. Okay? And so Governor Favis, his name was Orwell Favis, is going to start telling the people of Little Rock to go to your school and circle around that school by holding hands and resisting the powers of change. You know, these white folks, they're boys and girls, they're teenagers. They all held hands and circled the entire block of the school. And they shouted, two, four, six, eight, we ain't going to integrate. They would, shout, they would shout out, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. They had no plans. To protect these folks, Governor Fabus brought in the National Guard to put down the resistance of those who were against what was going on here around Central High School. Well, this made the nightly news. And President Eisenhower saw this. And President Eisenhower told Governor Fobbs that he is taking over the National Guard of Arkansas. And the president did it. And he says, if you do not go through and bring integration into this school as quickly as possible, I'll bring the 101st Airborne Divisions, the ones who parachuted behind the enemy lines on the morning of D-Day. I will send them in here and I will take over the state of Arkansas and reconstruct you as if we have just won a civil war. This is the president who instigated D-Day telling a governor what's going to happen if he don't behave himself. And General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, took over the National Guard. Now, I'll ask you guys a question. If the federal government takes over the National Guard of Arkansas, Who's the governor have now as his protector against these infiltrators? The answer is the highway patrol. He brought the state highway patrol up here to protect the white folks here at Central High School against his National Guard that's now under federal control. It's totally crazy. Finally, around the 20th day, on the 24th, the 24th day of September of 1957, nine black students were allowed to enter into Central High School. The next day, Governor Favis canceled school for the whole year. He told his parents across the state of Arkansas, mainly in Little Rock, whose kids went to Central High School, he says it is time to start your own private schools. It is time to start your own homeschooling system and get your kids totally out of the way of the federal government and their decisions. And across the South in the late 1950s and all through the 1960s into the 1970s, communities begin to build their private schools. They begin to build private schools. Now, here's the sad part about all of this. The one group who should have been neutral in all of this is the church. But these churches had church buildings that were only used on Sunday and Wednesday nights, and these churches had Sunday schools. They had Sunday school classrooms. And so your Baptist, your Methodist, your Presbyterian, your Church of God, your Church of Christ, your very Pentecost, your various Pentecostal churches begin to convert their schools or their Sunday school schools into private schools or private academies. And they charge tuition for your kids to go to school there. But you're paying property tax that supports the public school system. So these people who don't want their kids going to school with black students are going to pay a double price for their kids to be educated. You know, I found out, guys, these private schools could not compete. The federal government gave all these public schools 
money to buy overhead projectors and smart boards and computer labs and all of this stuff, the private schools couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford to hire teachers that had full-fledged degrees in education. They hired people that only had two years of college, which is not enough for a school teacher. They're not, they can't be certified. When I was going to school at Ole Miss, almost half the kids up there had gone to private school. And what I discovered is a lot of these kids at Ole Miss were freshmen or take remedial classes because they had not enough hours and enough, enough education from their private schools. Their first year of college was high school, trying to get caught up. Their first, second year of college was their freshman year. And so these kids at Ole Miss were spending five and six years trying to get through college because they had gone to private schools. They could not afford the equipment, could not afford the instructors to teach these kids. And it's sad. It was real sad. And they realized how they had struck out, how they had messed up. And it's their moms and their grandparents who caused all of this stuff. Okay? So it's interesting here, guys. And here comes the private school movement across the country, across the South. Parents are paying tuition to send their kids to school, but paying property tax to support the public school system. It's really an interesting time period here trying to deal with this. In 1963, the United States Congress passed an education bill, and this education bill says that if your county school system is integrated, that you will get additional state funding. It forced a lot of counties to have integrated school systems. Now, here in our county, Oakland County, we didn't have this problem. Oh, we did have two black schools in which black kids had to go to, they were Carver Hill and Crestview, and Combs down here in Fort Walton Beach. Those are your two black schools. And by 1961, 62, those schools are now integrated. And these black kids are going to Niceville High School. They're going to Choctaw and Meg's, where Meg's is today. They're going to Crestview High School, where Richburg is today. And our county totally integrated because they got more federal funding because the schools were integrated. We had very little trouble integrating our schools in 1963. But boy, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, the Carolinas, they had war breakout. Pensacola had war breakout. Tallahassee had war breakout. You had some trouble in Walton County. You had some trouble in, in Milton. But we generally had a pretty smooth transition here in 1963. There's a little bit of trouble in Crestview, but it's not like it would have been elsewhere, okay? So the federal government steps in, guys, for the first time to provide education funding for schools that integrated in this time period, okay? So I want you guys to keep that in mind during this time period. In the election of 1952, Adlai Stevenson ran as a Democrat against, Pre against General Dwight Eisenhower, who's a Republican. A lot of people like Eisenhower because they had served under him during World War II, but Stevenson thought he had a shot at it. And he really thought he had a shot at it in October of 1952. President or General Eisenhower had chosen Richard Nixon to run as his vice president. He's not a very good choice, but Eisenhower chose him for one reason, that Richard Nixon was tough on communism. That's the only reason that he chose Mr. Nixon to run for his vice president. And then the scandals broke out all kinds of scandals about Richard Nixon's background, how he got involved with the mob, how he got kickbacks and all this stuff, his service under the McCarthy hearings. And Eisenhower told Richard Nixon in October, this is in, is in November, this is the first of October, it's only four weeks out. And he tells Richard Nixon, you gotta clean this mess up. If you don't clean this up, I'm gonna drop you off the ticket. I don't care if I win the presidency or not. 
but I ain't gonna have you as my vice president. You can't explain yourself. I wouldn't want to be Richard Nixon facing Eisenhower in that discussion. And Richard Nixon decided that him and his wife, Pat, would go on the television and tell the American people that he's not a crook. In other words, he had a lie. He had a big, he had a lie big time. And I'm pretty sure that one of his, one of his advisors before this speech was Roy Kahn. And he told Richard Nixon to tell an alternate truth. If you repeat it enough, it will become true. Lies can become truth if you repeat them enough times. And Richard Nixon got up there and told the American people that he was not a crook, that circumstances made him look like he might have been in trouble. He was not. He was trying to do the work of the American people. Then he brought up his dog named Checkers. Checkers was a pound puppy. His two daughters wanted a puppy and they went to the pound and got Checkers. And Checkers apparently had a checkered past. And Richard Nixon used the analogy between Checkers and himself to win over the American people. Any country western song will become a hit if there's a dog involved in it. And Richard Nixon knew that he could use Checkers to get him out of trouble and the American people forgave him. And this was called the checker speech. Remember that Richard Nixon is gonna to be tough on communists. He did enough here, guys, to get by. Eisenhower did not drop him, and for eight years, he'll be your vice president, okay? He believes the presidency will be handed to him in 1960s election. He believes that nobody is going to stop him from the presidency and then being reelected. Okay, you guys remember also, this is the time period of the 21st Amendment in which we go through and say a president cannot run more than twice for the presidency. That he only can serve as president for eight years total. He cannot run for reelection after eight years in the presidency. We do not want a dictatorship in which Mr. Roosevelt could have turned into in the 1940s. Okay. Mr. Eisenhower comes into the presidency and he is going to have some issues to deal with here, guys, particularly with, with, the, uh, with the civil rights movement that's being started during this time period. I've got my notes out of order here. Hold on, guys, for a second. I might can recover where I belong here real quickly. Yeah, I got it together here. I just got things just kind of messed up over on the side page. All right. Mr. Mr. Eisenhower is going to be a president that is called the Hidden Hand Presidency. People believe that he's a grandfather of the country. He's 65 years old as president. Or actually, he's 60, 60 years old as president. And everybody believes that he is going to be a grandfather of the country. He will not do a whole lot. That his advisors, his vice president, his cabinet members will do all the work. Well, it turns out that Eisenhower fooled him. Eisenhower appeared to go off fishing a lot, going off on the golf course a lot. He did love, he did love playing golf at, less, at least once a week. He'd go out fly fishing. That's a, that's a big pastime for most American presidents of the 20th century was going fly, fly fishing. And he was pretty good at it. And people said that he was not actually doing his job, that he was just being a make pretend president. It's called the hidden hand president. Even though he appeared to be leisurely and being a grandfather figure, he was very much at work. He knew what was going on and he controlled the country. Okay? He's going to appoint a gentleman that's going to be head of the Department of Defense. His name is Charles Wilson. And Mr. Wilson tells President Eisenhower, our best defense in America is going to be superhighways in which the military can be transported from coast to coast. We'll, be, we'll build these great four-lane interstate highways that will go from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. They will go from the Gulf of Mexico and the Mexican border all the way to the Canadian border. These highways will be designed for American protection. 
Charles Wilson proposed the, the Eisenhower Interstate System here in 1955. By 1956, we're starting to build our interstate highways, okay? The interstate highways becomes the largest public works program in American history, okay? And right now in this time, in our time period, the interstate highways have been neglected and it's time for a new federal program to rebuild these interstate highways. And I said, and I think instead of just building interstate highways, let's go ahead and build the super train system, the high speed train system. Let our highways be for electric cars that are self-propelled and know where they're going through a computer using GPS systems in which you sit in the back seat and enjoy yourself watching TV and drinking beer or whatever you want to do on the back seat and let the car do its own thing. We'll have no car wrecks. We'll have no highway patrolmen to pull you over. You might break down and have to come become rescued, but otherwise, it's going to be an interesting system. And then build the super speed train system to back it up, to carry American goods on the trains. If you guys ever go to Mossy Head and watch, it, and watch the CXX trains come by, you're going to see tra car, train car loads of cars. You're going to see train, you're going to see train box cars or flatbed cars that are full of semi, semi trailers. There'll be two or three of them stacked on top of each of each other. And they're all full of consumer goods going to the marketplace. Y'all go to Crestview and Crestview or go to the Tuniac Springs or go to Mossy Head and watch those trains come through towns and come through the countryside. You'll be totally amazed how much traffic there is on the trains along Highway 90 going from Jacksonville, Florida, all the way to San Diego, California. It's amazing. Okay? So, here come the interstate highway system. Guess who Charles Wilson had worked for? He was a former chairman of the board of General Motors. Who makes sure that his automobiles will never go out of existence? That the American people will always have to have their cars. The interstate highway system is going to back this up. And you're going to have over 100 million cars on the highway before you know it. It's going to be a crazy time period here for the American people. Okay? But there's more trouble for Mr. Eisenhower. This time it comes out of Mississippi. Over in a little town called Money, Mississippi, is a young boy who's 14 years old who just arrived from Chicago. The young boy's mother is concerned of bad influences around her son, and she sends him down to Money, Mississippi to stay with his grandpa. She feared that grandpa could straighten out little Emmett. His name is Emmett Till. His mother told him before he left to Chicago to be careful around white folks. Don't talk to them. Mind your manners, yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am but don't get caught into a conversation in which you could get into trouble because you could be trapped by saying something you should not have said. When he gets some money, his grandpa tells him the same thing. In early August, him and his friends go out, rent, rent, go out to have a little bit of fun. They probably involved a swimming hole. And on the way back to the house, they stopped at the country store. Inside the country store is going to be a young lady who is manning, who's manning the store. She's a white woman. She's 23 years of age. Emmett and his buddies get their treats. They go to the counter and they pay for it. And as Emmett leaves the store behind his friends, he turns his head and tells the woman that she sure does look nice. That young white woman is going to tell her husband that this young man, this young black man, had insulted her, made a pass at her. And at midnight that evening, Roy Bryant and J.W. Millen are going to break into the house of Emmett Till's grandfather and they kidnap Emmett. 
Emma is not seen for two weeks. Close by to Money, Mississippi, is a river, and it's a it's it's, it's a so it's, it's a drainage river out of northeast Mississippi, and it runs down toward Oxford. At Oxford, they dammed up the river and made Sardis Lake, big huge lake. It's bigger than the bay out here, between between Nashville and, and Nashville and Fort Beach and and Freeport and and South Walton County. It's a huge bay. It's a huge river. A huge lake. And then it runs on down to the Yazoo River and it comes out at Vicksburg into the Mississippi River system. There's a pretty good sized river the Tallahatchie and Yazoo put together. And they had taken this boy and had beaten him to death. They used clubs to beat this, six, this 14 year old kid to death with. These are adult men. They got a cotton fan out of a cotton mill and tied that 75 pound fan around his neck with a rope and threw the body into the Tallahatchie River. Well, it's dry season, Mississippi in September, August, September, it's pretty dry season up through there. And the river started getting low. And within two weeks of Emmett Till being thrown into the river, his body begins to surface. These two men have bragged around town about how they killed Emmett. And they were arrested and they would go to court here in September of 1955. And in the court case here, these two men declare their innocence and the 12 white men jurors found them not guilty. And they were released. They had murdered this boy and yet they were released. A white jury made sure that white folks were not gonna be found guilty for harming or even killing a black person. Well, Emma's mama got extremely mad about all of this stuff. She had the body of Emmett embalmed and brought back to Chicago. And at his funeral, she had an open coffin funeral. And the people saw how badly beaten Emmett was. You guys can go and Google this. Go to Google, type in Emmett Till and go to images. And you will see his picture as he was as a 14 year old and see his picture as a corpse going to the grave. It's a horrendous picture, okay? And yet these men got off of it. The first day of December, 1955, Montgomery, Alabama. And downtown Montgomery is a big department store that's called the, the Montgomery Fair Department Store. And in this store, they sell all kinds of clothing, boys, girls, men's, women's clothing, which means if you sell suits and clothing of various kinds, that you've got to have people who are seamstresses, people who can let out sleeves and take in sleeves and fix pant bottoms and fix waistlines and hem the pants and all this kind of stuff. You know, hem the, hem the skirts, all this kind of stuff. Well, in this apartment store was a young lady about 40 years old who's from Tuskegee, Alabama. She had gone to school at Tuskegee. She became a seamstress. She moved to Montgomery and she was very proud of her job here in the Montgomery Fair Department store. And on the 1st of December, 1955, she leaves her job to board the city bus to go home. 80% of the riders who rode the Montgomery buses to and from work were African Americans because they could not afford on their meager wages to buy an automobile. So they would save up their 15, 20, 25 cents, depending on how far you had to go across town, to ride the bus to and from work. Rosa left the department store. She goes to the, to the bus stop on the corner. She goes into her coin purse and she finds her 25 cents. She snaps her coin purse shut and she puts the coin purse back into her bag, back into her, her purse. The bus comes up and the bus is not very full. It's fairly empty. She comes into the front door and she deposits her quarter in the slot where you pay for your bus ride. But being a black Montgomery, she cannot enter the bus and go through the middle of the bus where white folks are sitting. 
She's got to get off the bus, go around the backside, and board the bus through the back entry. Then on the back of the seats is a sign that says colored on both sides of the bus, one on this side, one on that side. And there's holes in the back of the seat so that sign can be moved backwards as more white folks get on the bus. Moses sits down right behind the colored sign. The bus goes down a couple more stops and it comes to a front of a big hotel and a bunch of men on a convention decide to get on the bus to go to eat lunch or go to eat dinner. And there's one man that has no place to sit. So he takes the sign from in front of Rosa and puts it behind her head and says, gal, which is an insult, gal, get out of that seat, that's mine. But you have no right to sit into a white man's seat. And Rosa would not get up. She says, man, not, she, said, she said, sir, my hands are sore. I've been sewing all day. I've got a headache. Could you please let me sit here? And he refused her. He got mad and went to the front of that bus and started cursing at the bus driver. The bus driver pulled the bus to the side of the road, went back there and tried to pull Rosa out of her seat. And she was got her legs wrapped around those seat, those seat legs. And she got her self in position that she could not be moved. The bus driver got mad, got off the bus and flagged down the police officers who were arrested, who arrested Rosa Parks for violating the Jim Crow bus laws in the city of Montgomery. They haul her off to jail. That evening, the word went across town about Rosa Parks was arrested. They couldn't believe it. Our little sweet Rosa, are you sure it's Rosa Parks who lives down this street here? The next morning, these folks made telephone calls across town. They got it with their black ministers and they decided to have a big, huge meeting. They met him in the larger churches in Montgomery. So there'd be plenty of room for people who wanted to hear what was going on. And all the ministers around Montgomery were invited to come to this prayer meeting about Rosa Parks. What they had done is they had planned to have a offering sent around to help pay her bail, get her out of jail, all of this stuff. As these ministers from around town gathered out, back in there's about 20 of them, as these ministers gathered around back behind the pulpit area, they started talking to each other what they could do. And one of the older ministers in his 80s turned to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King was 29 years old, just got his PhD from Brown University. He's from Atlanta, Georgia. And the old minister said, Reverend Martin, you're the most educated man around us. You are learned. Why don't you take over this situation? Because you'll have better thoughts and better ideas of how to, 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 sit, to work out this situation. And Martin Luther King became the head of the Montgomery bus boycott. And they decide the best way to teach the bus, the bus company a lesson is to the black members of the town, the black citizens not ride the bus. They went through and found all these black men and black women who own automobiles, and they recruited them to be the chauffeurs. They told the, the workers in Montgomery, they said, all you guys are paying 10 to 25 cents for your ride to work. Give that money to your chauffeur. You'll have money to buy gasoline with and put oil in the car, have the car worked on it, and make some money off of it. So y'all start riding in carpools going to work each morning. And they did. The white ladies of Montgomery got upset because their workers were not getting to work on time. And these white women joined in with the bus boycott. There's quite a few of these ladies in Montgomery got up in the morning about four o'clock, put the pillow next to their husbands, they got out of bed, so he thought so he thinks she was still there. And she would sneak out and go across town and pick up the help. And in the evening time, after the kitchen was cleaned up and the help had done all their work for the day, she would drive them back to work or have her husband carry them back to work. 
If you guys watch The Kill of Mockingbird, you'll see where Atticus Finch was always carrying Copernica home. He let her walk to and from the job that he carried her home in her automobile. When I was a little boy in 1953, my mother just had her third baby in 34 months. I hope they figured out what was causing the problem. Mother decided to hire a lady to come to our house to take care of me and Judy. My mother took care of Stan, the newborn. And her name was Geneva. And I love Miss Geneva. I love that woman with all my heart. She took care of me. She read me stories. She fed me. She said, Mr. She said, Mr. David, you are a sport. And I can still picture Geneva in my mind. And this wonderful lady who introduced me to a whole new way of life. I started seeing black and white as a four-year-old, as a three-year-old. Whenever dad went to go get her to bring her to work in the mornings, he'd carry me with him. And he'd make me stand on the front seat between her, between him and Geneva. Because Geneva could not sit on the front seat with a white man in Mississippi in 1954. She had to sit on the back seat. But by dad carrying me to go get her, and I being the buffer on the front seat, it was acceptable. Dad found a way against Jim Crow. Remember these boys from World War II come home changed. And they don't like, the, they don't like this foolishness of these games they're playing here with integration or segregation, I should say. Okay. So these folks begin to go get the help and bring them to work and carry them home in the evenings. By April of 1956, just a few months later, the Montgomery Bus Service is going bankrupt. The bus company goes to the city council meetings. And here, guys, in the spring of 1954, in 1956, the city of Montgomery is going to rewrite their Jim Crow bus laws. They're going to rewrite their Jim Crow bus laws. And it's going to change everything. The old colored signs go off the buses and anybody who pays for a bus ticket can ride. Do y'all know that Memphis, Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee, Chattanooga, Bristol, Kingsport, Richmond, Lynchburg, Raleigh, Charlotte, uh, Charleston, and Greenville, and Atlanta, and Albany, and Savannah, and Tallahassee, and Jacksonville, and Tampa, and Miami, and Pensacola, and Mobile, New Orleans, all had bus boycotts during this time period. And in, and in December of 1956, the Supreme Court rules that all city buses across the country must be integrated. Segregation has been killed on the city bus services across the country. The ruling was held up on the 21st day of December of 1956. Supreme Court ruled against segregated buses across the country. Dr. King and his group are going to start a new organization that is called the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC. This was formed in 1957. The head of, the, the head of this program will be Dr. King. The vice president is going to be Ralph Abernathy. And they are going to promote nonviolent, peaceful protest to gain new rules for equality in America. And Dr. King will use the example of Mahatmas Gandhi. Mahatmas Gandhi in India went against apartheid in the 1930s and 1940s. And he won civil rights for the people of India. But in 1948, Mahatmas Gandhi was assassinated. Dr. King knew the price. Mahatmas Gandhi says that you put your hands on the plow and you start plowing, you don't look back. You try to make change happen and you don't look back. 
Dr. King told his people that once we get started, we're not going to turn around and look backwards. We're just going to go forward. And we'll use peaceful protests just like Jesus used in the Bible. He says if we become radicalized and become violent, white Southerners are going to shoot and kill us. There'll be a race war. We have got to have peaceful protests to do this with. Okay? Mr. Hoover of the FBI is totally convinced that Mr. King is a communist. No, he's a freedom fighter. He's a freedom fighter during this time period. He's trying to find a way to make America better, where Mr. Hoover is going to wiretap his telephone and try to find him talking to communists and field traders. Mr. Hoover called his wife almost three times a week to tell her, your husband's in bed with another woman. We are spying on him and he's in bed with another woman. One time he called her and told her he, she was in bed with three women. Trying at ways to upset the apple cart. Well, guys, in 1957, the state of Alabama won a list of all the men who were involved in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. There's a hundred of them. They won the name of these hundred people. And there's a court case that goes for the Supreme Court that is called the NAACP versus Alabama. The Supreme Court rules that the NAACP does not have to give anybody a record of their membership. That the, N, that the, NC, the, the SCLC is a private organization and Alabama has no right to the information of who belongs to this organization. I want to tell you guys something. If Alabama got the names of those men, they get into the Ku Klux Klan, and you'd have you'd have a hundred dead men within two weeks on your hands. The Supreme Court realized this. Thank God we had Earl Warren, who had experienced racism earlier and realized how wrong he was. And he's going to try to correct the wrong. He's going to try to correct the problem. Okay? In 1960, you're going to have sit-ins across the South. Your drug stores, your drug stores have lunch counters. And these lunch counters are only for white patrons. And here in early 1960, a bunch of the students from North Carolina A&T decides to go to the Woolworth store in downtown Greensboro and sit at the lunch counter to order them some food. The black ladies who work behind the counters told these black students, y'all get out of here. You're gonna cause trouble, y'all get out of here. Don't give us any problems up in here. Y'all go home. Well, soon here come white patrons into the lunch counter and they were mad because all these black kids were sitting around on the stools around the lunch counter and they couldn't order anything. So they go to the manager. The manager comes down and tries to deal with these black kids who will not give up. They're determined. They're peaceful protesters. And the manager calls in the police department and has all these kids arrested for trespassing. You all know they said that as soon as these kids got to the, to the police station, they got themselves all written up and were given a court date to go and see about, being, about the trespassing charges. Once they were released, they were back at Woolsworth. They said sometimes the same kids got arrested as many as five times during the day because they go right back to the Woolsworth store and start all over again, okay? This goes on for the entire winter of 1960. Now here comes April, and April is Easter season, and people have quit shopping in downtown Greensboro. White folks are scared to go down there. And in downtown in the 1960s is where your penny store is and your Sears store and your Red Goose shoe shop is and your Buster Brown shoe shop and your men's clothing stores and your ladies' clothing stores. And Easter time is coming, which means that Southerners bought brand new outfits to be in church on Sunday morning. You did not miss, miss Easter Sunday services or you were a heathen of the worst degree in the American South. They had talked about you for weeks if you were not in church on Easter Sunday. And these folks in Greensboro were never scared to go downtown about their clothes. They went to Charlotte. They went up to Winston-Salem. They, they went over to Durham. They went to Raleigh. 
They went to other places to buy their, their clothes for Easter. And the merchants in downtown Greensboro were losing money. They were going bankrupt. And so they got together and went for the city commission. And the city commissioners told Woolsworth, if you do not integrate that lunch counter, go ahead and close your store up. And Woolsworth decided to integrate. And all across the South in 1960 and 1961, lunch counters were integrated and people were allowed to eat. Okay? Peaceful protest is where it works, guys. And even in today's world, y'all are still seeing peaceful protests take place. Okay? All right. Now, Mr. Eisenhower is going to do several things that's going to change America. <clears throat> Okay, let me see what my time is here. I might be running out of time. I got, I got an hour. Okay, Mr. Eisenhower is going to be working with trying to rebuild a new kind of America. And he realized one of our biggest problems is our debt. We have a lot of debt from World War II. So he decides to put a higher tax on the wealthy class to pay off the debt. Now, the wealthy class didn't argue with the general from World War II. They knew that he was determined. And this top 5% had to pay a 90% income tax in some instance, instances to pay off the national debt. You know, guys, if we charge the top 5% in America right now, 90% income tax, within four years, we have no debt. And if you make $100 million a year, can you live off of $10 million? I want to try it for a couple of weeks. If you make, if you make, if you make a million dollars a year, can you live off of nine hundred, uh, off of ninety, off ninety thousand? And the answer is yes, you can. One of the first things that John Kennedy did as president was increase the in, was was to go through and lower the income tax from the rate that Mr. Ray, I mean Mr. Eisenhower had put into place here in the nineteen fifties. Mr. Mr. Uh, Kennedy decided the best way to help the American economy is to give lower taxes. And that's hard to imagine a Democrat doing that. Republicans normally do the, the tax, the, uh, the, the tax decreases. And here it's all, it's all flip-flopped here in this time period. Okay. Mr. Eisenhower also realized, and this comes from Mr. Roosevelt's program, and it also was part of Mr. Truman's program, and I'm going to do it here because more was done in the 1950s toward the GI Bill. The GI Bill is going to have 10 million American veterans of World War II to go to college. It's going to put the American boys in college. I want to tell you something. Most of the boys of World War II were farm boys. They never had a chance to go to college. My father started college in 1937, and grandma and grandpa got all over him. They said, what are you thinking? Go get a job that college is totally worthless. And dad said, no, college is of a value. And he got a scholarship over in New Mississippi to play, to play basketball at East Central Community College. And he got two years of college in on his basketball scholarship. Then he had another scholarship to go, to go to Mississippi State to play baseball. When he got that time came around, World War II was breaking out, and he joined the National Guard, hoping to avoid the major fighting in the war and still go to school. Of course, the Guard was called out the first thing. So he does not go to school from 1939 until 1948. And he has a GI Bill. The GI Bill gives him four years of college for free. He finished up his BA degree, and then he got his master's degree, all paid for by the GI Bill. He became a school principal. He left Mississippi in 1957. He moved to Laurel Hill, lived there three years. He went to Southside in Crestview for three years, and then he went down here to Valparaiso, and he taught it, and he was a principal at Edge, his principal at Edge Elementary. So Dad really kind of toured the county here in Oakland County during his tenure as a school principal, okay? 
the GI Bill paid for it. Do y'all know we had more, so many boys in 1946 that wanted to go to college that all the girls' colleges had become co-ed? Florida State becomes Florida State School. It comes from, it goes from being Florida State School for women to Florida State College because the men showed up. They had so many kids going to college on the GI Bill that some universities had classes going on 24 seven, six days a week. They didn't have school on Sundays, but they had school in the middle of the night. You might be signed up for a calculus class at one o'clock in the morning. They had so many people coming out of World War II, these young men, and they were looking for sweethearts. They had been denied women all these years and they wanted to get married. And so you had a shortage of, of family housing in these colleges. And they took old quasi hunts around the country and turned them into married couples dormitories. It's crazy during this time period. My mother told me she was going to school in Hattiesburg, some Mississippi. She said those boys came home from World War II and she said they had money in their pockets. So these old 19 year old boys they were dating didn't have anything much going on. And she said these boys came in out of World War II. We started dating them because they treated us like queens. Do y'all know that the average age difference between a married couple in the 1940s, he was usually about 28, she was 18. There's a 10 years difference in the ages. My mother and daddy were exactly 10 years apart. He was born in September the 25th, 1918. She was born September the 10th in 1928. I said, dad, when you were, when you were 20 years old, she was only 10. Listen, they're not right about all this stuff, you know? And of course, they got married and had three babies in 34 months. You know, these baby boomers, we had lots of playmates because our neighborhoods were full of kids because our parents were the same age. And I had a lot of friends whose mothers were German and mothers were English and mothers from Holland and mothers from France and mothers from, from uh, Japan. They all married these young ladies as they were liberated from the war here in this time period and brought them home with them. Some of the best athletes at Nashville High School were those boys who had German mamas. Their daddies from Alabama and Georgia got in with the Air Force Base here at Eglin, bought homes, had their wives with them, had all these children of European descendants. And those little German boys, they could play some baseball and they could shoot some basketball. They were something else. Uh, in my time of playing sports here, okay? So the GI Bill is one of the greatest programs that's ever helped the American people out. In today's world, we're discussing giving you free tuition, buying your books for your first two years of college. If you go to a community college in America, you'll have free tuition and you'll have free books. And once this pandemic comes to an end and Mr. Biden can get that push through colleges, you too are gonna to have to compete for your classes. And you might have some classes in the middle of the night if it works out the way we think it might work out in this time, in our time period, okay? So Mr. Eisenhower, Mr. Truman are gonna be heavily involved in this GI Bill getting American kids educated. And I'll tell you guys something, they measured, they majored in new areas for growth. They majored in computers. They majored in engineering. They majored in medicine. A lot of medical doctors came out of World War II. Okay, a lot of these guys were medics on the battlefields. They decided to go into medicine, become doctors in the 1950s. And they were good doctors. They did a good job with it. Okay, you start seeing people go to college, become college professors, become teachers and educators, people who worked in social science, people who work for nonprofit organizations. All right, even the women get involved. Once the husband finished his schooling, usually the wife signed up. If he had a year left on his GI Bill, she could use it. And so you started seeing the ladies get degrees in education and nursing. And, and being physicians and, and other jobs of this nature. So you saw a lot of change take place, guys, in this time period, okay, when it comes to education. And then, of course, here comes the Housing Act. 
with all these new kids being born and all these people being leaving World War II, we need houses in America. And here comes the amazing housing projects. And we started building what is called the suburbs. And all across the country, people started buying houses using the GI Bill. My parents bought this house I'm sitting in right here on the GI Bill. They bought this house in 1963. Their interest rate was like 3% on this house. They got a 30-year mortgage. They paid $72 a month for 32 years to pay for this house. The house sold for $13,000. I spent $17,000 rebuilding the bathroom. And here in my kitchen, I show it to you, I got some dishes stacked up over here. But in my kitchen area, I spent almost 20000 in my kitchen, putting in new cabinets and putting in a center island and new refrigerator and stove and all this stuff. And I've got a pretty good size kitchen here that I'm doing my classes out of uh, today. So they use this money, guys, to expand themselves, to, to bring success to their family. For the first time, the American farm boys do not have to worry about their children working as kids. Those farm boys of World War II are the last generation that had to work as children on the farms. And they made sure that us kids, that their kids, did not have to work as children. They provided for us during this time period, okay? So the GI Bill and the Housing Administration played a major role here in this time period, okay? Well, guys, we're gonna have some interesting situations that takes place with Russia. In 1957, you're gonna have a new prime minister of Russia whose name is Nikita Khrushchev. And Nikita Khrushchev is very much involved in science, particularly in space. The new frontier, as John Kennedy called it, is going to be space. On October the 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union is going to launch into space a satellite that is called Sputnik. It's a little bitty spear, not very big, but the size of a basketball. And on this little spear is going to be prongs. And all it does is go beep, beep, beep. And they travel it, they put it into, into low space, and it goes around the earth making this beeping noise. The United States believed that Russia had conquered the whole universe that night. And we got upset. President Eisenhower got upset. And President Eisenhower in Congress is going to appropriate funding to improve education of math and science across the country. It is called the National Defense Education Act. We're going to start teaching math and science to the American kids. Okay? And here comes the big push to create NASA, the National Space and Aeronautical Group here. And here comes NASA. We're going to start building these space these spaceships here, trying to test out if we can beat the Russians when it comes to space. On the 3rd of January, 1959, Alaska becomes a state. On August the 21st, 1959, Hawaii becomes a state. And now we have 50 states in the union. Now we have 50 states in the union. Okay. Well, guys, it's also during this time that aviation changes. The United States has entered what is called the jet age. The Boeing Airplane Company has developed an airliner called the 707. It's a four engine jet aircraft that can fly about 5,000 miles. The cruise, the cruise speed is close to 550 miles an hour. Over in Santa Monica, California, Donald Douglas and his company has built an airliner called the DC-8. It also carries over 150 passengers. It has a four engines under the wings, two on each side, and it too can travel under 600 miles an hour. And America enters what is called the jet age. But the first jet airliner ever built was built by the British in 1954. The airliner was called the Comet. This plane has got four engines that goes through the wings. It's a very sleek looking airplane. You, know, you guys go and Google in the comet and look at the pictures of the early comets. The only problem is they put big picture windows 
or the passenger seat. The passenger seating would give you big picture windows to look out of. The windows were too big. These airplanes started flying around 1955, and all of a sudden, after about 1,200 hours of flight time, they started crashing. And we discovered that the windows were breaking out of the airplane. The windows were too big for pressurization. The planes would crack. The windows would crack, and the, and the plane would go down from depression, from being depressurized. And so we started trying to find a ways to improve flight. They went through and rebuilt the company with, with regular size windows you have today, the smaller round windows or the smaller oval windows. They did better than the big picture windows did, and they do not blow out in flight. I have not heard of any airliner that's crashed in the last 60 years, 50 years, that had a problem with the winds. Okay? But from this, we're going to create what is called the Federal Aviation Agency. The FAA is going to inspect your airliners. They're going to certify and license your pilots, your flight attendants, your engineers, the ground crew works on airplanes. The FAA sees over the safety of, a, of America's passenger jets. Okay, the new airplanes. Okay, we also created what is called the National Safety Board. The National Safety Board to make sure that we investigate whatever happens to these airplanes. And so now we have ways to make sure the airline's business is safe. You know, when I was a kid in the 1960s, we had an airliner crash pretty regularly. I mean, it was nothing that, and you'd have them in threes. And you'd go for six or eight months, and then there'd be three plane crashes. And you'd go in for another, another year, and then another set of airplane crashes. We had a bunch of plane planes crashed in the 1970s. Today, with all of our computer systems and all of our new technology and so forth, you never ever hear of a plane crash, except that new Boeing 737 MAX. But that was caused because of the poor engineering on the computer systems. And the pilots not being well trained to handle it. I got a good friend who flew the 737 MAX for, for about six months until they were grounded. He said, no, no, that airplane. He says those people were not trained in how to handle the airplane. But now it's been fixed, apparently we're gonna start flying it again, okay? But the National Transportation Safety Board was behind all this stuff to make sure these planes, these airliners are safe to fly, investigate accidents to find out what caused them here. So aviation totally changes by 1963. Here comes the short range airliners to serve your local hometowns. Here comes your Boeing 727s. And in 1966, here comes your Douglas DC-9. In 1968, here comes your Boeing 737s. Do y'all know in 1967 that Southern Airways flew into Eglin Air Force Base? They had 12 DC-9 airliners that flew in here. You could fly nonstop from Eglin by 1970. You could fly nonstop from Eglin to Orlando. From Orlando, the plane either would go to Miami or to Fort Lauderdale. You'd be in Fort Lauderdale, guys, in three hours from Eglin. You'd be in Miami in three hours from Eglin. We flew nonstop to New Orleans. I flew to New Orleans one morning, and it took 22 minutes to get there. We had nonstop flights to Mobile that went to Jackson, that went to Memphis, and on to St. Louis and Chicago. You'd be in Chicago in about four hours out of Eglin. They had those little 20-minute stops along the way. You could fly nonstop from Eglin to Washington, D.C., and it went on into LaGuardia Airport in New York City. It's amazing. We had like eight flights a day between us and Atlanta. And on these DC-9s, these Southern flight attendants would serve you food. The drink on board the plane was a mint julep. So you just flying up here in Southern style, as they called it during this time period. You flew to Atlanta, they served you a biscuit breakfast with biscuits and jelly and bacon and scrambled eggs on a 35-minute flight. When I flew to New Orleans in 22 minutes, they gave me a wine basket because I was too, too young to drink wines. They gave me a cola and I had a big roast beef sandwich. I had a chips and an apple in that wine basket. Between the flights between Orlando and Memphis and New Orleans and Eglin and other places, they had a wine service in the afternoons. They served wine and cheese on board the airplanes. You guys will never see this again. Wine was an adventure. And when I flew to New Orleans in 1970 on Southern, 
The flight took 22 minutes and the flight cost me $16. That's crazy. That's totally crazy. So guys, aviation really boomed here in this time period. Look at the Air Force. I'm sitting here at the end of runway 19. Y'all hear these airplanes fly over my house, pulling up and going straight up and all this stuff. I'm trying to do lectures. Today's been relatively quiet. Thank goodness the dogs have behaved themselves and the airplanes have not flown too much. Well, I have seen the SR-71 fly over the house. I have seen the C-5s. I have seen the, 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 the C-47s. Um, I have seen the C-19s. I've seen the F-111s. I've seen the Star Lifters. It's amazing all the airplanes that I have seen come across my house. I even saw the 747 with the space shuttle on top come across the house three times. So aviation was very, very big during this time period. Aviation is what built Oklahoma County with Eglin Air Force Base and all the divisions of corporations who service Eglin, like Lockheed Martin and Boeing and all these different companies that are in here. So the airline business played a major, major role here the Air Force played a major, major role here in Oklahoma County because they brought in the service that we needed to build our economy, to build our tourism uh, in this time period. Okay, in 1956, Nikita Khrushchev becomes the Prime Minister of Russia. And he realizes that he cannot compete with the Americans. He cannot compete in this space race, in this atomic race this nuclear weapons race and in 19 and in 1959 he decides to come to america for a visit this is unheard of for a communist leader to come to a free country for a visit he flew in and he flew into idaho airport that's now called john kennedy on long island and he had a brand new russian turboprop airliner and that plane was fantastic looking. It had two propellers on the engines, and this plane was massive. And he flew in here, and he goes to Camp David to visit with President Eisenhower. And these two men liked each other. These two men had several days of great talks. They enjoyed each other's company. They even planned to meet each other in 1960 in Paris. And the president's looking forward to going to Paris to meet this gentleman. Well, Fidel Castro, I mean, uh, uh, Nikita Khrushchev is going to leave Camp David, and he's going to fly over to Iowa. He wants to see American cornfield. This little short, stout Russian man was impressed of the size of the American corn. And then he flew to Hollywood. And here in Hollywood, the Hollywood studios are going to greet him. They're going to give him all kinds of attention here. And Nikita Khrushchev is going to party with people like Marilyn Monroe, Elizabeth Taylor, and all these famous stars of this time period. He wanted to go to Disneyland, but Walt Disney, but when Walt Disney denied him, he told Nikita Khrushchev, I have got children who have driven across the country, and all they have is one day to enjoy Disneyland. And if I let you go and have to close the park now just for you to go, these kids would have driven here for no reason. And so therefore, Nikita Khrushchev did not get a chance to ride in the teacups. All right? So it's interesting here. Well, guys, the Paris meeting is going to fall apart. Because in the, in the early part of 1960, Francis Gary Powers, who was based in Turkey, is going to take off from Pakistan in a U-2 spy plane, plane, a U-2 spy plane, and fly directly over Moscow and make pictures. This plane flies at 80,000 feet, the edge of space. And we fear if the plane was ever shot down, there'd be nothing left to identify. Well, guys, they shot down Francis Gary Powers, and he crash landed. There's not only a, a plane intact, there's also a American pilot. And Nikita Khrushchev got mad and he said, I will bury America in its own time. And the Cold War heats up. I was in elementary school during this time period. I just started school. 
and they started training us for nuclear attacks. They told us at home to fill your bathtub full of cold water after you bathe, get in there and scrub the tubs out and put cold water, because we didn't have bottled water in 1960s. In 1961 or 1962, during the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis, we didn't have bottled water. So mother got in there with the claw rocks and she scrubbed the tub out, washed it out real good, and she filled it up to the brim with water, with cold water. We were told to get a closet in the hallway and fill it full of medical supplies. Mother had all kinds of bandages in there and, you, and methyl aid and all this stuff, BPN ointments and all this stuff in case somebody got hurt in a nuclear attack during the night. We were told our windows were jealousy windows. They rolled out. We were told to, to, to put bisqueen plastic over these windows and duct tape them to keep nuclear waste from coming to our homes. It's crazy time here, guys. At school, we were taught to be like Myrtle the Turtle. Myrtle the Turtle to duck and cover. And we would sing, duck and cover, duck and cover. We got on our knees, put our hands over our heads, and got as low to the ground as we possibly could. I was in fourth grade at Bob Sykes Elementary during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mrs. Dennis, my teacher, made us go through and practice duck and cover every afternoon after lunch. And we got around that wall and we all got on our hands and knees and ducked and covered. And one little boy says, why do we do this every day? And one little old boy answered, to learn how to kiss your ass goodbye. <laughs> Mrs. Dennis came unglued and she tore those two boys up. I mean, she had that paddle ball pen and she tore them up for saying all of that in fourth grade. I saw a nuclear explosion at Bob Sykes Elementary School that day. Went home that evening. Mother had the tub all cleaned out. We all got our baths, got our pajamas ready to go to bed. Mother got in our hands and knees and scrubbed that dang tub out, filled it full of cold water for the umpteenth time. Ten minutes later, my little brother Scott, who was four years old, walked in there and peed in the bathtub. I saw a nuclear explosion that night take place, too. Mother came totally unglued when Scott peed in the bathtub. All right? So, guys, it's some interesting time periods here in northwest Florida during these crises that dealt with the nuclear explosion. They told us. They said Eglin Air Force Base will be the first place they're going to attack. They told us that they told us they're going to go from Homestead to McDill, well, actually from Homestead to McCoy, which is now Orlando International Airport. Then they're going to go to McDill in Tampa and then hit Eglin and hit, hit the Naval Air Station in Pensacola and hit, and hit, and hit uh, Keesler and Biloxi and make their way on up. We're the first ones going to be hit by a nuclear weapon here in this time period. It scares the Jesus out of us little kids. We were little old kids, eight years old, wondering about nuclear explosion in the middle of the night. Talking about the boogeyman getting a hold of you. Y'all think about having a nuclear weapon looking in your window, you know? And that's how it was for us kids during this time period. And then, of course, in 1959, a young man from Cuba is going to start court in America. It actually comes in 1957. And he tells the American people that he wants to build a new Cuba and for us to help him out. Well, he went on the Jack Parr show and talk about his new plans for Cuba. He's on the Ed Sullivan show, on the Milton Burr show, on all these big TV shows, he was there hawking for money, asking for money. And we American people gave him close to $400 million in donations for him to build Cuba and go communist on us. And of course, his name was Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro is gonna bring in communism here to the areas of Cuba. Okay, well, I tell you what, guys, this is a good place to stop. I don't have much more to go on here, but I do want to spend a little bit more time on the civil rights movement. So I'm going to include this in the next lecture because I don't have that much to really cover in the next lecture. I'm going to just kind of hit the presidents, hit Vietnam, hit the presidents, and I try to get all kind of wound up when I get to Mr. Clinton. I will discuss a little bit about Mr. Bush and a little bit about Mr. Trump. There won't be a whole lot because it's all too recent but I will give y'all a little bit of background on all that stuff. So lecture number 11 is gonna start in 1960 instead of 1969. So I'll start in 1960, and then I'm gonna continue on up to the present time period. 
and then I'll come back for the second, for the last lecture, number 12, is going to be on the American family and pop culture starting in the 1950s. Okay? All right, that's it for this lecture, and I will see y'all for the next one.